I'd like to, uh, ask the speakers to try to stay within the uh, roughly 20 minute speaking time. It should be about five minutes speaking time, except for the speaker this morning who has about 15 minutes. I'm going to follow the time schedule that's in the book here rather than in the handout. And I will forego my opening remarks, which I'm sure will be probably unnecessary for this session. Anyway. So the first speaker this morning is uh, Professor Gilbert Sommerjai from the University of California, Berkeley. And he's going to speak about the service structure sensitivity of pain absorption and calorie activity of transition analysis. Thank
In the 1930s, mostly due to John Bordine at the University of Illinois, uh, a, a smooth surface model was developed, which for metals used the so-called gallium, where gallium is sort of an electron gas or an electron gel that was used to explain many of the properties at that point known about surfaces. These properties included the Burr function, that each crystal phase had a different Burr function, that even xenon adsorption changed the Burr function. So adsorption changed the Burr function. And this model, which allowed a smooth surface to spill over, spill over electrons uh, by tunneling, and have a surface dipole, so so-called surface space charge, uh, uh, to provide an electrical field in which the uh, any atom, any polarizable atom, of course, was uh, polarized and, uh, and and changed the work function could be explained. Also, this model was the one that explained a Schottky barrier, that the barrier between an oxide and a metal interface. So it served a very useful purpose, and it stood up until about the 1950s. And on the 1950s, uh, due to Burton, Cabrera, and Frank mostly in Bristol, uh, the rough surface rigid lattice model was developed. Now, uh, this took into account many information. Uh, uh, this is the rigid lattice model uh, that indicated that in, in crystal growth or evaporation uh, of many, uh, many surface uh, changes, the transport uh, indicated the presence of steps, kings, and atoms, that each side has different number of nearest neighbors, but each atom sits in its equilibrium position expected from the bulk structure. So if you knew the bulk structure, you immediately know where the surface atoms are. This is why I would call this the rigid lattice model. And it stayed with us until the past, mm -hmm. I would say, five to eight years. Uh, just like in Middle Europe, there is a, a peaceful revolution, there is a peaceful revolution in surface science. In fact, we went from the, the whole rigid lattice model to the model which I would like to call dynamic surface restructuring model. What I'd like to show you is, in fact, the surface is mobile, it's flexible. The atoms move about their equilibrium positions into new structures. And we cannot understand, in my opinion, catalysis. And most of the puzzles of catalysis, unless we, we uh, look at the surface as a dynamic uh, structure. And that's what I like to uh, uh, hopefully convince you. <coughs> now, let me just show you the facts first. If you take a clean surface, the surface atoms indicated by this line are always contract. They are always close, closer to, to the second layer than subsequent layer. So the rigid lattice model for clean surfaces doesn't work. Any surface will show an, an, an inward movement like this, and that inward movement uh, depends on the roughness of the surface. This is data from Marcus and Jonah, in which the roughness, I'm sorry, the contraction, the minus sign indicates a, a contraction, and the surface is known as a function of uh, uh, roughness. And the roughness is defined as 1 over the packing density. The more open the surface, the rougher it is. And the rougher it is, the larger the contraction perpendicular to the surface. So open surfaces relax, as we call them, relax very much. Now, that relaxation, in case of directional bonding, leads to the well-known restructuring, <coughs> reconstruction. This is the iridium-110 surface, and the, the yellow in the first layer atoms are contracted inward, indicated by the arrow. The second layer red atoms are moving out. The third layer uh, blue atoms move in, and in fact, there is a missing row model. There's a missing row here, and the second top layer atoms missing. And this is, in fact, the restructured surface structure. So there are big troughs here. <laughs> Almost every one one of face of face and the tubing metals show this sort of restructuring. You can ask the embarrassing question, where are the missing atoms? And in fact, we have a very hard time to answer that question uh, until the advent of the scanning tunneling microscope. They just sit, well, never mind. Let's go on. Now, this is molybdenum. 
Now you see molybdenum on, on the 100 surface show what we call random reconstruction. That is the atoms, instead of sitting in their periodic positions, they are moved apparently randomly, probably not randomly, but uh, to, uh, to, uh, to low energy, uh, to surface crystallography, they look pretty random. And in fact, the molybdenum 100 surface, just like the tungsten 100 surface, is disordered. Is disordered. So we are far from rigid lattice size. <coughs> Now, when you go to a step, this is the rigid lattice uh, uh, scheme of a step. But a step, in reality, looks like this. The first atom is pulled inward by the normal two steps of an angstrom. Then there is a small crack opening up here. And so the atom shifts all over the place. And this is how a clean step surface really looks like. Now, when it really becomes important, when you start to do chemistry. As soon as you absorb atoms, you find that in addition to all these restructuring of a clean surface, the surface becomes restructured by formation of chemical bonds with, between the adsorbate and the substrate, which are usually just as strong as the metal-metal bonds or the substrate-substrate metal uh, uh, atom bonds. Now, this is the one that is already important for CO hydrogenation. Nickel, one of the best catalysts for that, on the 100 phase, have a square unit cell. As soon as you absorb uh, half a monolayer of carbon by, let's say, a boudoir reaction, uh, CO disproportionation, uh, the yellow atoms are carbon atoms, the uh, pink atoms here are nickel atoms, the nickel atoms move away from the carbon to make the whole bigger, so the carbon atoms can now bond to nickel atoms in the second layer underneath. But this puts a tremendous compression on the nickel-nickel distance here. As a result, the unit cell rotates by a small angle this way and then this way, and this rotation re uh, uh, relieves release the compressive stress. And this is now the structure of uh, nickel 100 with half a monolayer of carbon on it. Now, as soon as you uh, absorb hydrogen to remove carbon as methane, you go back to this structure. And you go back and forth, back and forth, within the time scale of chemisorption. And we're talking about milliseconds or so. So, the surface is dynamic. There's a local structure here around the adsorbate that goes back and forth. So, there is no such a thing as a rigid lattice here. Now, this is another example. The sulfur, but these are all surface crystallography results from low energy electron diffraction that can locate the bond distance and bond angles of both the adsorbates and the substrates. This is iron, 110 surface, and most like iron surface. This is the usual bulk like uh, surface structure. Then you have turned the sulfur atom, it, it goes into a fourfold side, but now just the opposite happens as what I have shown you before, now the iron atoms move closer to the sulfur to form a cluster. And that keeps a bigger distance between next nearest neighbor iron atoms. When you remove the sulfur, you go back to this structure. So within the time scale of chemisorption, the surface is restructured. Now this is an important one because monosulfide is a good fissure from scatterers. Um, if you take the disordered moly surface and you put sulfur on it, Sulfur disorders the surface even more. In fact, for every surface where the sulfide that forms is a layer compound, we find that sulfur has a fantastic effect of disordering the three-dimensional lattice in transit to form a two-dimensional layer compound. This is true for tantalum, for example, that forms tantalum sulfide, true for molybdenum to, to make molybdenum sulfide. On the other hand, when you absorb carbon, Carbon has the effect of ordering molybdenum into a rigid, well not rigid, but certainly a, a periodic fourfold lattice where the carbon atom occupies the fourfold side. So sulfur disorders, carbon orders. Okay? But a tremendous effect of the adsorbate on the structure of the substrate. Now, uh, this is the final example. We have uh, the iridium 110 uh, uh, missing row model, the sulfur atom sits in a brick site 
and the size of the prop. And, and this is the structure. None of them are intuitively uh, predictable. But we have a tremendous variety of restructured surfaces. Uh, in fact, I would tell you now that almost any surface uh, under conditions of chemisorption is restructuring. The, the more open, the more easily restructuring, but all surfaces seem to restructure. Now, this is an interesting reaction. This is zero oxidation reaction. The reason I bring this in because this is the first quantitative evidence that a catalytic reaction is driven by surface restructuring or changes of oxidation state of the surface. This is the reaction that was studied in great deal uh, on the 100 phase by Earthfall, and we studied the 111 step surfaces here. It shows oscillations, oscillations uh, that you can see with the thermocouple very easily, where the period of oscillation can be controlled by the carbon monoxide partial pressure. Now, on the 100 surface, uh, the explanation as provided by Erdogan is the restructuring of the platinum surface from a 100 sort of a square unit cell to a hexagonal unit cell. And because the reaction, the dissociation probability of oxygen is much greater on the uh, hexagonal surface than on the square surface, this surface uh, has an oxygen rich surface composition, while this surface has a carbon monoxide rich surface composition. So the reaction has two branches. Now how you go from one branch to another, that's not easy to explain, but there are some interesting theoretical treatments. But there are other models here, and uh, this type of restructuring is not present on the 111 phase, yet the 111 phase also oscillates. And there the explanation is, is that the surface of platinum is oxidized. And during the reaction, you go from a more heavily or less heavily covered, oxide covered surface. And this oxidation reduction cycle then seems to follow the turnover rate, the turnover time of the catalytic cycle. So changes of composition or changes of structure seem to drive the catalytic reaction. Or you can argue the other way. The catalytic reaction drives the changes of the structure or the changes of the composition. It's a chicken and an egg uh, question. Now, uh, this is a, a, a system which uh, surprisingly uh, uh, several of us, uh, Professor Goys in, in, uh, in, in the Netherlands and myself had the interest uh, completely independently and, and we arrived to study this system, this is the growth of iron oxide on a platinum 111 surface. When we add sodium to it, now alkali metals are known promoters, but alkali metals do other things uh, in addition to accelerating CO dissociation. What they do, they dissolve the oxide, in this case the iron oxide, and encapsulate it like this. And this dissolution of the iron oxide in the sodium and reprecipitation as little islands like that is reversible if you remove the sodium or the potassium from the surface. So complete restructuring by an adsorbate, in this case potassium, occurs. But in this case the time scale is much longer. This is mass transport control time scale. And the point is in all these slides is that you have restructuring on the time scale of chemisorption, on the time scale of catalytic turnover, and on the time scale of mass transport along the surface that leads to either deactivation or redispersion of the catalyst. Now, this is the major message. And so what I'd like to do now is to try to recast all the puzzles of catalysis and try to explain them this way because I don't know how else to explain it. The problem with this approach is that very often I don't have any, any proof. I know what I have to do to prove it, but the proof is yet to come. Now, these are some of the puzzles that I'm, I, I'm really uh, interested in in, in the analysis. The fact that chemistry is associated with roughness, that's not obvious. Uh, I will show some of the evidence and, and basically the explanation is the more open the surface, the rougher it is, the more easily it restructures. And the dynamic restructuring is the one that's needed to do chemistry, to couple into the molecular orbitals and break bonds. 
Then I will mention the last, the structures, no, first, the oxide metal interface, because this is very important for CO hydrogenation. Okay? And I will try to show you that the same pattern that titanium oxide and other SMSI uh, uh, oxide will give to the metal seem also present for many metal metal bimetallic systems. I'm not claiming it's the same phenomenon, but it looks very similar. <coughs> and then try to give a simple explanation why CO hydrogenation is structure in cells using the same dynamic lattice restructuring environment. Now first of all, rough surfaces do chemistry. Okay. Well now this is very easy to uh, very easy to prove. <coughs> you can take a, a flat, stabbed and king surface and you can absorb a, a molecule on it. And in this case it's called monoxide. And what you see, you, you take a step surface, then you absorb carbon monoxide at low coverage. This is 30% of a monolayer coverage, and then you increase the coverage and then you do a thermal desorption. What you see is carbon monoxide comes off at this temperature. And then as you increase the temperature, increase the coverage, you get two desorption peaks. And it's very easy to associate the higher temperature desorption peak with carbon monoxide at the step. And then the lower temperature desorption peak with the terrace. And it's always, as far as I know, always the case that the adsorbate always comes off at a higher temperature from the defect side, the step, than from the terrace, indicating a higher heat of adsorption, which of course means that the thermodynamic driving force to break a CO bond or a hydrogen-hydrogen bond, if that's possible, is much greater as is the defect. Now this is clearly seen for hydrogen adsorption, the flat step and king surface, where you have a flat surface Hydrogen comes up at the lowest temperature. On the stack surface, the same temperature and higher. On the king surface, king, step, terrace. So clearly, these defect sites have higher heats of adsorption. And that's not that difficult to rationalize. What is difficult to rationalize is that the same sites are also very good catalytically. Very good catalytically. Now, these are... Uh, data from molecular beam, H2B to mixed molecular beam uh, scattering studies in my laboratory and also in, in George Komshaw's laboratory at the KFI in Uri. Now, the reaction probability on a single scattering to break an HH bond on a step platinum surface is almost unique. When we did it back about 10, 12 years ago, this is Steve Bernasek's work and, and uh, Miguel Sauner we found on a flat surface, it was down by order of magnitude. But George Komsha did much better. He actually made the surface, the platinum 111 surface, absolutely defect free. In fact, by using helium atom scattering that's proportional to the residual defect, he could actually do much better than we did. And the better he did, the less and less the defect the probability is. In fact, this was his detection limit. He found that when he scattered H2B to mixed beams from a 1-1-1 defect free platinum surface, he could not detect any dissociation. So there's no chemistry here, and if you have steps, there is chemistry there. And this is where the puzzle is. Because if you have a higher heat of absorption for hydrogen at the step site, that means a longer residence time for hydrogen. And if it's a longer residence time, it should have a slow turnover. Right? It should be a lousy catalyst. But in fact, that site is also catalytically very good. Now, how do you explain that? Both chemisorption and catalysis at the same sites, it's contradictory. Well, we live with that, and I've tried several models, but never mind. I mean, this is just one puzzle I'd like to, to measure. Now, here is another one which is interesting. This is work by Harald Ibach at the same Unit Laboratory in which he used by a high resolution electron loss spectroscopy to look at the decomposition of ethylene on the nickel 111110 and step surfaces. And what you find is that on the flat surfaces, or reasonably flat surfaces, there's a decomposition pattern, they're all very similar. You form acetylene and C2Hs, 
but the decomposition, the pH bond breaking occurs around 230 Kelvin. On a step surface, it's below 150 Kelvin. The more, the rougher the surface, the lower the temperature at which you start breaking chemical bonds. In fact, if you look at the effect of roughness, it appears much greater for a given element than changing across the periodic table, going from element to element. Okay? Let's say going from nickel to uh, tungsten, okay? but keeping the surface structure the same. Now, so really roughness is very important, both breaking, uh, making, uh, breaking chemical bonds and also in catalysis. But it, there's also coverage dependent effect. And this is, I mentioned that because I think theoretically it's very interesting. Uh, this is a, a treatment by Professor Levine at the Hebrew University, in which he brings in hydrogen to a metal surface, a metal surface, and he assumes that in fact the bond breaking is associated with the restructuring of a metal atom, a metal side. It moves into a new lattice position. However, at low coverage, in the limit of one hydrogen molecule, this is a very stressful situation. You have a very high strain energy. And so that makes the recombination reaction very rapid. However, if you go to high coverages, where you put a hydrogen molecule and dissociate at the next side, and the next side, and the next side, you have a restructuring, and it's like a zipper. It zips out. And so at high coverages, you see, the restructuring is much easier because you can relieve the strain energy as compared to low coverage effects. This is, for example, why we see very interesting structure sensitivity for H2D2 exchange at low pressures in a molecular beam. But of course, nobody who ever does that at high pressure ever could see any structure sensitivity that is one of the most structure insensitive reactions uh, known. Now, let me go to now the, the effect that is important for CO hydrogenation. This is an area of research that both uh, uh, Professor Bell and I uh, uh, are interested in and we collaborate in it. And so what I'm going to tell you about is some of the work that came out of this collaboration and uh, his student, uh, Kevin Williams, uh, an outstanding student and who just started to look for a job in the near future. He's also a chemical engineer. So uh, now the oxide metal uh, question goes back to, to Schwab to Schwab, who in the 1930s, due to some very clever uh, studies, found that if he had an oxide metal interface, there is some nonlinear effect in reaction rates that uh, were very hard to explain. And he tried. He really tried. And there are two ways of making these interfaces. You either put the, the metal on the oxide, and that's the usual case. Or you do the other way around, and that's how we do it. You put the oxide on the metal, because you can vaporize the oxide, and since the oxide has a lower surface free energy, it grows layer by layer. It's better controlled this way than that way. But both ways give an identical result. <coughs> that already tells you that the periphery area, the oxide metal interface, is really the culprit, it's really doing the chemistry. Now the way we do is we take, in this case, titanium metal, we vaporize it onto rhodium, and then oxidize it to form little islands, and here you are, and then you titrate with carbon monoxide the remaining metal sites. Okay? And so it's a very nice uh, model system. Now, of course, those of you who have followed uh, uh, the pioneering work of Tauster and then some very excellent science that came out of it know what's happening with this mumbo jumbo heat treatments that one has to do to really get an oxide effect. And what's happening here is you first you reduce the oxide, uh, and that means that the metal will be encapsulated by the oxide. That can be followed very well with chemisorption and, 